We're delighted. I'm going to do the introduction even as our guest speaker joins us, and I'm, I don't even have an opportunity. I'll, I'll, I'll dispense with the opportunity that I would otherwise have to say hello and shake hands, so I'll do that afterwards. But we're delighted to be joined today by um, former Conservative MP and Chair of the UK Government's Energy Digitalisation Task Force, Laura Sands, CBE. Um, Laura's very professional experience includes time spent in journalism, public relations and advocacy, but obviously um, very well known uh, as for her service as a member of parliament in the South Thanet uh, constituency between 2010 and 2015. You know, there's loads of stuff written down here about uh, Laura that I could tell you, but I'm going to just cut that if that's all right. We can come back to it afterwards. Um, she um, has a huge amount to offer on the agenda that we're interested in. I'm going to dispense with any further introduction. I know she won't mind that. And you can check her out on LinkedIn anyway and all over the place. So delighted to welcome straight to the podium from the airport. Not her fault that she was delayed. You're so welcome, uh, Laura Sands. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And many apologies for a plane two hours sitting at uh, Gatwick. And um, but just wonderful to be here in Dublin. So thank you all very much. And thank you to Mary, who was the star of the show. So I'm merely here as the follow up. <laughs> and it's lovely to see John. We work together on the Northern Irish Advisory Group for, the, for their energy strategy. Thank you all very much. And so I think I have been asked to do a little tour of what possibly, what I think probably the energy sector is going to look like in the future. And um, <clears throat> as a recovering politician, I, am, <laughs> I have just about re-entered the human race. Um, when I left politics, I decided instead of being one of these sort of broad political people, I would become a plumber. Because ultimately, it's the plumbing of the energy system and how we look at it that really needs to change. Um, not that I'm very good when the system goes wrong or the boiler, but when it comes to energy, I have a few um, contestable ideas, and I hope that you will contest them. So um, I've done quite a lot of work with Imperial College, with lots of other collaborators, and ESB was one of the funders of one of my uh, reports on regulation. But this was really, this report that we did, and it would be, this is a bit of a synthesis, was about um, the recosting, how we've got to look at this system quite differently and how the system changes are going to absolutely demand us to have different business models. And so ESB, this is an interesting um, proposition possibly from your perspective, but also digitalization and modernization. Now you can start throwing tomatoes at this particular moment, but you know something, the energy sector, pretty old fashioned, not quite there, you know, at the forefront of how the system works. But here we are, this is a politician sitting here, Dr. Doolittle, looking at the past and looking at the future. We've got in the past, big is beautiful. Um, there's this great thing by Ari Sargent, designed and built by engineers, bastardized by economists and marketeers. The power industry continues to deliver one of the most successful consumer confusion programs of all time. I mean, does one need to say anymore? And he is an energy supplier in New Zealand. So there you go, he does know. Our big is beautiful. We've got blind man's bluff. Um, we have, you know, an energy system operator in the UK. They think they know what the system looks like. And then suddenly the lights went out in 2019. And suddenly we find out they didn't know what the assets were on the system. So big is beautiful. We're moving to a very new world and it's a really difficult psychological change. Um, I have to have something from Monty Python on it. Blessed are the cheesemakers, because actually what we're talking about now is distributed system design, much, much more, um, many more capital assets rather than commodities. Transportation, you're in the networks business, other people are in transmission. Um, the networks cost is going to start to become a very, very different thing. So what does this really mean? Is we have got a new cost, a new value, and a new price for energy going forward. So we currently live in a world of a commodity, wonderful electron, but actually the commodity is going to go down in value. 
the capital costs that again have to fit everywhere within the system in your driveway on your roof in the irish sea on your transmission the capital is what is going to be the core cost of the system and not a zero marginal cost of of an electron but a much much lower one and just think about this 1990 a terabyte of data was a million dollars today it's five cents now i'm not saying an electron is going to go there but we have got this very very different system very capital intensive then if we look at the consumer side the consumer is going to have to access these assets and so what are we going to have to do they're never going to be able to do that off the back of a commodity we're going to have to look at financial service products we're going to have to look at different business propositions there is a great thing that's going on in spain at the moment which is an eve um in villages um the network company is actually saying to the to everybody they've all got solar right that to everybody electricity is going to cost you absolutely nothing absolutely nothing what you will have to do is buy a subscription to our storage capacity so we become a very very similar to cloud storage and that's also where we're going to get different business models that are going to be weirdly although i know centralized and big as beautiful people don't believe this but actually the more distributed system we have potentially and i think in reality is more resilient weirdly if we set it up properly but where is the value and the value doesn't sit in those silos the value sits in the optimization which is the middle and that is what in many ways the sector has not been always able to pick up it hasn't been the most digitally savvy it hasn't been the most um, aggressive when it comes to new technologies but demand and supply will become equal e equal value not necessarily scale but value within the system so how can we pick that up now I used to show this to Ofgem our regulator and Ofgem was in the middle looking very confused and they all got a little bit upset about this but this is the new in many ways paradigm of if you're running an energy system whether you're a regulator whether you're a large company is how are you going to manage all these different variants and it's a very new set of requirements for the energy sector um, and we've got a lot of different dynamics all being shown here but in the UK we have 400 people who run the energy sector and weird they all know each other's golf handicaps it's fantastic and they are moving to 100 million actions and assets on the system so if you think every EV car can do three things export import and store if you think that the number of evs on the system by 2035 our energy system operator says will be the equivalent of three nuclear power stations in terms of capacity right we have got a very different system and either we can ignore the 100 million and have to build absolutely extortionate amount of infrastructure or we have to bring it into the system so what have we got we've got a new system where whether I, I find it fascinating I know everybody in energy needs to understand the weather but you know what's fascinating is it doesn't take price signals it doesn't follow legislation it's got no we have no agency over weather we have a lot more agency over demand if we do it sens sensitively capital is king blending assets so I've come back to my cheese makers there are a lot of people in the energy sector who are commodity makers and I would call them milk farmers and I'm sure it's the same in Ireland but it's certainly the same in the UK milk farmers get screwed they get absolutely pushed right to the edge if you become a cheese maker you start to add value and how do we create blended products and assets balancing costs are absolutely rocketing rocketing and to be frank between balancing costs constraints etc and curtailment costs in the UK if the UK consumer really knew that ooh, I think um, we would have a lot more problems but our ESO says by six by 2035 60 percent will be done by demand that is a massive increase distributed asset values as I said EV cars 
and value of demand will be the new creator. You could say that there is a new competitive pressure between those who deliver optimized demand and those who are looking at optimized supply and where that tension lies. So the risks and opportunities, we've got the big stuff. Well, you all know about the big stuff. We've got the clever stuff, which I think um, the energy sector is embarking on and starting. And I'm sure Mary told you how brilliantly ESB is doing in this space, et cetera. Um, the new things is really the small. So how do we create distributed asset models? Um, the difficult, which is my old life, which I refuse to now talk about. So that's something that your public affairs people and all of that will have to deal with. But planning being absolutely the most delightful challenge, I think, for everybody. But then there is the different. And the different is customers, different forms of, of fuel, biodiversity, and communications. And I don't know whether Mary talked about this. But if we are to have a digitalized system, communications systems are going to have to be co-planned. They're going to have to be as resilient as the energy system. And I'll come on to a little example of that where things could have gone a bit pear-shaped. Um, and these are the three drivers of change. New market player, that is demand. Suddenly this customer who's been pretty I don't know whether it's the same in, um, in Ireland, but in the UK, we have divided 60 million people into six archetypes, right? Amazon divides the UK into 150,000 different archetypes. So do we really think that six is, is going to be adequate? Do we really understand our customer? And do we really understand what our customer is prepared to do and how we should serve that? The second is about digitalization fundamentally, but it's about different business models, blending, um, resource optimization. And the third, which is probably one of the most important, and I'll only skip on this at the end, but I do, you know, you've got fabulous talents in Ireland, but just start to think beyond the energy sector for that talent, because that is what we're going to need. We're need, needing logistics people, all sorts of different talents that need to come in to deliver a very different system. So I'm going to just start, start with demand. So I believe, and I'd love to hear other views, but anyway, I would believe that going forward, demand is equal to supply. Even the physics tells us that. Markets should be designed around it, but currently, actually, the de <clears throat> demand is seen as sort of a little bit the victim. The energy sector is a bit like a hose pipe and it just sort of comes and sprays you with energy. And there isn't really that, that thing. The, these are the costs, the 10%, un under 10% in the UK went to demand um, side assets um, in, in, out of the so-called the, the UK government funding. We did some metrics and I won't go into this in too much detail, but, if you want to look at these metrics, this is apparently, I have been told, the first time ever has ever been done. And that is, we have compared demand and supply assets according to whole system costs, not according to the levelized cost of electricity, but as these other costs, such as networks, balancing costs, et cetera, come up, if you look at the whole system costs, then, and you start to compare demand and supply, what do you get every time you put a demand asset on the system you lower whole system costs it's really really interesting and that is <clears throat> something that i'm working with world economic forum with the bayes modeling team um our department's modeling team did this with me in frontier economics and we're trying to get the treasury to start to understand that these demand assets actually lower whole system costs Designed around customers. Now, it's quite interesting because, again, and again, you can all shoot me, but I do think that we're quite far behind on ter in terms of understanding customers, really designing our products and propositions. I do a lot of work in the food sector. 
and food is really really interesting when i was little we had something called the milk marketing board the beef marketing board the uh -uh marketing board right and they set prices and you go to your little shop around the corner and you would be a price taker and a choice taker and actually very grotty stuff was there now you can say supermarkets are good or bad and there are lots of issues around that but they sort of broke that up but they then captured me totally. But now, actually, the patterns in food are starting to become dispersed. So I go for my base load to, let's say, Sainsbury's, and then I will have a bit of self-supply, right? Because I grow some carrots. You don't want to eat them, but I grow them. Um, and then I have some special supply, which is, you know, maybe a veg box or something delivered to me specifically, and I can go to the farmer's market. This is all designed around choice. There is one interesting thing about storage here as well, is the food sector, before we had refrigeration, food, uh, we lost about 60% of food. And what is refrigeration in energy? It's storage, but just Bear with me on my crazy analogy. Long duration storage, what's that? Frozen food. Grid scale batteries, refrigerated warehousing. EV cars, flash freezing. The most important component of the food system in terms of refrigeration is a fridge in your home. Because if you didn't have a fridge in your home, supermarkets would have to be four times the size they are today. So if you think in other sectors, what has happened, how we, how systems have been optimized, you only have two wheat crops a year, you eat bread every day. So actually the food system is more intermittent than the energy system. But these storage vectors have absolutely reduced and optimized system design. So I think it's a really interesting analogy. The second is um, from mainframe to PC. I mean, I remember, oh, have you not got a big IBM churning out in the back, right? Um, and everything was designed around these big, in many ways, again, a bit like hose pipe type analogy. You start to get the PC, which of course everyone said was going to be, would never work, never, nobody was ever going to take it up. And you've now got a system that's quite differently designed. It's not to say that you don't have large centralized supply of data. But what you have is it all, is all designed around my utilization. It is not designed, I am not having to design myself around the mainframe. So these demand models have all been, we've, other people have gone through the model. And then we have this other challenge coming up, which is this, the world of the customer is going to want more than energy. They are going to want assets too. And we were proposing, um, and I think some of it might happen in the capacity market. And apologies if I'm becoming very geeky here, so do. Um, but the capacity market and other markets, um, how are we going to unlock these assets for hard pressed customers? And the just transition is a really, really important component of this. And we're not going to be able to do it if we're expecting people to write out checks. So service agreements, financial service products, um, capacity market payments, et cetera, are all going to have to be really important. And I don't know whether it's the same um, here in Ireland, but it's really, really, really difficult to get um, policymakers to really understand that this has to be a consumer-led um, system. And so there's a recent consultation, sorry, there's a recent con consultation that's coming out on retail reform. And the word customer satisfaction or joy or pleasure or um, control or anything about customers is, is virtually invisible. It's all about structures and what the, the industry is going to do rather than customer centric. And so just to illustrate this, I have, I have a dream and the dream is that um, <clears throat> We open up the supplier world to lots of different types of propositions. So it comes back to my specialist supply. So I would like, let's say the car leasing company is Nissan Car Leasing um, with 10,000 cars in Dublin. 
okay? So they've got 10,000 cars. They are selling me, or they're leasing me a car with 300 miles embedded in it every week, right? So I don't really know I'm buying, I certainly don't know I'm buying electricity, that's for sure. I don't know really that I'm buying energy because fundamentally it's just come with the package. So I get my 300 miles. If of course I want to top up, that's a different matter and more expensive, right? But anyway, that is what, and Mr. N Nissan has got his 10,000 cars. So what is he doing? He's adding capacity to the system. So there is a micro capacity market payment. He also then sells, not the 10,000, but 4,000, because to be frank, 8,000 are going to be static all the time, as we know. So you've got this sitting asset. So they will sell it to, I mean, they'll sell the flexibility to ESB networks in Dublin, right? And there will be that, that relationship. But also Nissan, rather than me, because I don't know how to access the best time, the best tariff, etc., will be absolutely determined and, fun and focused on getting the cheapest commodity price possible. Because the incentive for them is to do that. Because in some ways, we've now got an incentive with suppliers who their incentive is to supply you more energy. But this model actually means that Nissan is really incentivized to get you the very, very cheapest in the best way possible. So the incentives are aligned. I get a little bit of a cheaper car and I also get much, much cheaper miles and I have no aggro. I don't have to be engaged. I hate that. When customers have to be engaged, sometimes it means that they that the energy world want them to become heating engineers. And I don't think that's, despite me saying that I like being a plumber, I'm just not sure that we're wanting to turn people into energy geeks. The second theme was about digitalization, and I'll be really, really quick on this, but from the 400 to the 100 million of actions and assets, if anybody thinks they're going to be able to do this with the system design that we've got today, um, they're going to have a, a big shock, right? This is multiple changing consumer preferences. Lots of interactions between different asset classes with different characteristics, different personalities. You've then got issues around cascade. If you are the system operator, you're going to be saying, oh, my God, I've got storage. I've got demand side. I've got different assets coming in at different times of the, of, of the day. This has to be absolutely deeply digitalized and with all the protections that go with it. But it's going to need, require a much more dynamic and bi-directional scheme, interacting in dynamic markets. So when people think that digitalization of the energy system is some form of, so, so when we started the digitalization task force, it was quite funny because um, <clears throat> we got all the networks in the room and one of them said, oh, I've got a fabulous person, absolutely brilliant on digitalization. You must meet him. He rolled off, he rolled out uh, Microsoft Word really, really well within the organization. And I was going, oh, right, okay, fine. So I think we've got to really go back here and start working out what your understanding of digitalization and data and all the rest of it. It is not the IT department in that sense. It is much, much deeper. And to be frank, also, when we look at it, it's going to have to be structural digitalization. Not, It's not an add-on. It's not a a nice little halo that you know one can get rewards for it is actually part of the structure um, of the system and these are the key components which give you whole system visibility interoperability and automation absolutely crucial is this customer control and consent if you don't have that you don't have flexibility assets actually you get um, very very clear rejection Autom automated asset registration. So um, this is being developed at the moment in the UK. Um, so that is quite far down the line. Um, we also propose the digital spine, which is a very, very, very thin layer of interoperability across the whole system. And it, I would call it the HTML of energy. And I'm also working with the IEA to look at this as a global asset. So there's some really interesting stuff going on there. And, 
can talk about that at some point. Um, share, share data, it's always an interesting one. All these companies thinking, oh my God, my data is incredibly valuable. It's so exciting. So what are you doing with it? Well, I don't know, but we've got it and it's really, really exciting. And I'm sure one day it will be really valuable. And they haven't even got data analysts to understand what really they're sitting on. The value of it is actually by sharing it. Um, and system operator visibility. So that is the digital journey that we've been proposing. And very, very last, but really the problem ultimately, and it's not the problem with the energy sector, it's the problem with so many different sectors. And that is that we need to change our culture and our skills. And everything is not about silos, it's about connectivity and interaction. Um, we've got to be looking at greater diversity in all senses. But actually, there's a, there's a very good, bad lesson. Um, apparently, VW was one of the very last companies to become, um, to really embrace the EV change and how they did it. And this friend of mine who used to work for VW said, um, well, it's not really surprising. Have you looked at the board? So the board very diverse fantastic in terms of superficially they were all mechanical engineers there you go <laughs> they could not believe that anybody would want to get into a horrible ev car the other thing that's quite funny is i don't know if you know but henry ford's wife mrs ford in the 20s um she loved her ev car much much more than she did her petrol car and Ultimately, um, she got over uh, ridden by uh, by the market, not by Henry, because he was actually quite keen um, on EVs as well. So I'm going to suggest I would love to see um, the system operator in whichever country, the first country that does this, I will send them a bunch of flowers. I would love a chief executive of DHL to be running a system operation. Right? If you think about this system, it is absolutely extraordinary. So I've got a pair of trainers in China. They go through about seven different transport vectors. Actually, human beings are in the middle of it. You don't have human beings in the system in that sense. You're not got people picking things up and putting them onto something. So let's say seven different transport vectors, all of them interrelated, all of them run by different people. Right. So, you know, the shipper is not the same as the trucker. And I, the customer, can see where at any moment, right the way through the whole process, where where that package is and if there's a problem or whatever. This is both customer centric and I wouldn't have thought a logistics company could be seen as being customer centric. They have. And the logistics of dealing with all the variabilities, it is all done through real deep digitalization algorithms, et cetera, but they can preempt and they can predict and then they can reshape their routings. So it's a really, they're really, really sophisticated. It's not DHL, it's all of those guys, right? The telco sector, really, really important. Um, how that works, particularly with the digitalized sort of, you know, multi fasted system, I think is really important. Consumer marketing. Oh, please can, oh, sorry, please can we get consumer marketing people in to the energy sector? Exciting propositions. And Amazon that, again, gives me a lot of visibility and control. So losers and winners. So if you're a milk farmer, you're gonna be a loser. You've got to become a cheese maker. Um, if what you're doing is just selling a commodity, you're going to lose out to people who are actually uh, designing and selling optimization services. If you take the victim approach to a customer, you will lose them to more innovative companies. And I'd love to see more data turned into products and services. This is a little tour of, you could say, you know, crazy vision. But I think that all the dynamics in terms of what decarbonization means, what the new cost base is, what we've got to deliver consumers and how quickly we've got to do that 
I think we can learn from others. We can really start to understand what this system could look like. And I think we would also then give, in many ways, the customer and society a decarbonisation dividend rather than, in many ways, giving them the bill. Thank you very much. Well, I don't know about you, but I found that absolutely fascinating. And as you said, a tour, a, like right across such an expanse. I can just, I really marvel at your ability and skill to bring all of this to life in the room, to take on relatively complex um, elements of this um, whole agenda and explain it. And your use of analogy and your ability just to, you know, the, the fridge wouldn't, you know, if we didn't have fridges, we'd have to, the supermarket would be, all of those sort of that, there's so many of them in the course of your presentation that actually would bring home um, any of these complex uh, propositions to even a very general audience. Now this is not, let's be honest, a general audience. This is a, an expert audience, but I'm sure it fascinated people in this room and indeed online, because I should have mentioned earlier, welcome to those of you who uh, have uh, joined us online and are still with us. I know there's upwards of 70 of you, so I know most of you will still be with us and we still have a nice group of people in the room. You all look very interested and I'm sure you all have questions and I'm open to questions and I'm sure Laura is as well, at least for a few minutes. So who would like to offer? John, John Fisher. Say who you are. We probably know who you are, but tell us anyway. John Fitzgerald, Trinity College, Dublin. Um, two questions. Security. Mm -hmm. um, a digitized system. My nightmare when I was on the board of the central bank was the payment system. Um, somebody, the Russians interfering with it, that you could collapse, uh, right, the payment system, you could collapse the economy for a few days, but collapsing the energy system is worse. So how can you deal with that risk? And the second, I found very striking at uh, two nuclear power stations that's the equivalent storage of all the evs in britain um to what extent can you use that you gave the example of spain distributed storage mm -hmm. but if you have a couple who are expecting a baby imminently and you you that battery is drained through the night to provide yep. storage um do you do people have to say actually i'm going to need the car in the next hour where normally they don't so how do you deal with that issue okay um starting with the security thing so we had a lot of pushback from the sector when we talked about um open data for the energy system right I mean, when we're talking if we're talking about Russians and we're talking about interference and they sort of said well you know then people are going to be able to manipulate it and and all the rest of it and I said well it's really quite interesting when you look at the infrastructure in the energy sector if you go to the little substation around the corner from where I live it's got a little padlock on right if you go to the really important one you've got security guards gun dogs etc it's quite easy to know where the vulnerabilities are in the energy sector. Now, it's not to say that digitalization doesn't create, in some ways, a, a different route in and a different system design. But if you think the banking sector hasn't been bad, I mean, it hasn't really has been pretty robust. Um, all sorts of other systems that are really important have got the systems in place we got gchq involved we got everybody or what i call the secret squirrels they all came out and um, visited us and there are some very very clear protocols it's not to say that it isn't vulnerable but to be frank it's vulnerable today and it is being encroached on today you might find that just because things, um, my, my feeling is just because things aren't open, uh, 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 closed, doesn't actually um, make them any safer. So I think there is lots and lots of system design that needs to be put in place there, absolutely. But I don't think it makes it less resilient. So security, insecurity of supply, I actually think it makes it more resilient. And I think it gives you greater visibility. And one of the things that I think is going to happen as we get much more distributed assets is we are going to have more failures. 
right? Mm. But they're going to be quite limited failures. They're going to be, so we're going to have to be a little bit more relaxed about not, I mean, I'm, you know, the, the UK, and I don't know about the Irish, but the UK gold platedness of the system is, is, beyond any other country i mean it's absolutely it, it's sort of absurd and so we can act we can lose a little bit but if i've got pv or an ev or a heat pump or something with flexibility in it i have got more resilience and so i think it's going to be be useful that on the evs everything is about consumer consent and everything would have to be done pretty slowly so when I was talking about the Nissan leasing company, I was saying 4,000 cars, right, would be available out of the 10,000. As I also said, I think it's actually 8,000 that will be static. You will have to start to learn and understand. Um, and you can always say on your charging, and I, I'm with a, a very successful Irish company that, um, tomorrow, um, which is an EV charging company. And you can put absolutely on your consent, I always want 20 miles in my tank, whatever, right? Or I always want 60 miles. Or I don't want to participate. Everything has to be driven by customers. And that's where, in some ways, the energy sector is going to find itself up against lots of different preferences. And it's not really used to that. So it's a, a new world. Over here. Laura, w wonderful lecture, really thought provoking. And um, sorry, Peter O'Shea, ESB, if anyone can't see me. Um, really thought provoking. I thought some of the analogies were wonderful. Um, as an electricity professional for more years than I remember now, you know, the, the, the structure of the industry is very much generation, which is becoming smaller, you know, smaller bite sizes, networks which are becoming bigger, uh, but yep. smarter. Um, and suppliers who are becoming more engaged in the service part of the industry and, and and then, of course, the customers. But we are locked into that sort of structure, right? That's the structure we've sort of inherited um, through liberalization and before yep. that through engineeringization, if you like. So that's the structure of the industry. And what I'm seeing from your from your talk is something I think sort of transcends all of that. And I just want to give, give any, any thoughts to whether that sort of industry can develop organically or whether it really needs a really big push from government if we're to go in that direction. So I think you're absolutely right. I probably don't remember. Right the very, very first slide, I had a child screaming in the corner, okay? <clears throat> and um, this is me being rude about our regulator. And I say to them that they've infantilized the sector, actually. I mean, they haven't, but it's one of my analogies, um, in the sense that they, certainly in the UK, they will tell a network what colour socks to wear on a Tuesday and what tie on a Thursday, right? And everything is, is process regulated rather than outcome regulated. And so, and if you think about it, and I don't know if it's, it, it's the same here, but I'm sure it is, nothing really fundamental has changed since, what, for 40 years? Right, the supply. I mean, has the consumer changed in forty years in everything else that it's doing? I mean, it's a totally different animal. It's got totally different needs. If you look at the system, the system needs something very, very different. And so the regulation hasn't. And the problem is, is that politicians are very frightened to tinker with it. I personally think the place to start is with the retail side because that is the way that you can unlock the rest of it. And it is actually, in my view, where it should start. We've got in the UK a price cap and the government is never going to be able to come off this price cap ever, unless mm. it changes the whole experience. So it can't say, right, we're just going to take the price cap away. Right, everyone's going to go tonto. If what they say is actually we have re-engineered and reshaped how you will be getting energy, and this is exciting and this will be much more tailored around you, it, they've got to create a better landing place. And then they'll come off the price. Then they can 
migrate off the price cap. So at this moment, there is an opportunity, but on the whole, it is so heavily regulated that you know the, your bill has to look the same as everybody else. To be frank, a customer today in the retail market is really just choosing between different coloured logos. Mm. That is it, right? I mean, and a marginal change with customer service. But as nobody wants to ring their energy company, because they shouldn't want to ring their energy company, it's that's a negative rather than a positive. But so we need to, to start with the politics mm. of energy and it, for all the worst reasons, it is very political at the moment. Mm. Then you redesign into the system. The other thing, of course, which is always fantastic with any politician is to say, oh, minister, well, that would be very brave because the lights might go out. And that is always, and it, it's absolutely, it's a cliche beyond cliche beyond, beyond cliche. And you know, it works every single time. <laughs> it worked on me, I guess. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Go for it. I got. To, sorry, yeah. I realise the time. Sorry for. Um, I've got two offerings here. I'm going to take the two together if that's yeah, okay. Yeah, so perfect. one one question each, if you don't mind. And is there anybody else just really burning with a question? I'm sure there are, but unfortunately, time is against us. So I think I'll just take those two, and then we'll close if that's okay. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Alex, and thank you very much for the talk and coming out of the car and going mm. straight on the stage. Well done. Um, I'm Fergal McNamara. I'm, uh, I'm Fergal McNamara. I'm the co-chair of the Energy Group here at the Institute. And um, right. yeah, Perfect. and I was really struck by the slide that you put up, which was the new way of looking at the levelized cost of energy, the whole of system cost. Oh, right. Yes. yes and yes. and that's definitely turned the table mats upside down because uh, some of the conventional wisdom that we would have assumed about the uh, the costs of certain technologies is totally different as a, as a, as I just glanced at your slide and you oh. said you wanted to do something with that and that that's what I wanted to explore with you you said maybe in the capacity market you could use it for evaluations or uh, treasury you're you're trying to impress treasury with it and, and get them to to do something thank you so it's I'll take of, I'll oh, my, I'll take it to, to sorry, your mind of course, okay? please please or you have to remember that one. Yes, I'm a member of the IIEA. My question is very simple. You've basically called for a major transformation of the um, electricity system. Uh, as a precondition of that, do you think that it is absolutely necessary to separate the uh, transmission and distribution uh, businesses from the generation businesses? As you know, here in Ireland, they're controlled. The ESB controls both and owns both. And uh, uh, I just ask you: Is it a precondition for innovation that this separation uh, should take place? And I just don't mean a separation nominally, separation of financing, separation of management, separation of ownership. And I don't mean privatization. I'm against privatization of the networks and the wires. Yeah. So I'll start with that, and, and I think everyone will have, a, in, in some ways, a different view. The way we've cut the sector up um, is pretty arbitrary. Um, I mean, it's, I don't know to what extent. I mean, I'm on the board of SSE Transmission, which is very separate from SSE's um, distribution network, right? And these are... I, I don't really know what the logic was. And I think the logic was because how the energy system, when it was all nationalized, was structured, right? So I think it's a totally arbitrary thing. I think you could make a case for either way for it to be much more integrated, for one to look at new solutions. I mean, I would like to see um, a lot more microgrids and a lot more innovation in that field. But to be frank, on one level, I would say to you, we are at such a difficult moment where certainly in the UK, and I think it's exactly the same in Ireland, we have not got enough infrastructure <clears throat> to actually bring all this fantastic resource that we both benefit from. And I would just get on with it and not worry about those structures particularly. I would really look at planning. I would really... Um, this is very unlike me because I'm sort of quite, I like efficiency and productivity. I would do a bit of over build to just 
keep the cost, I mean, reduce the cost over the longer period of time, get it done. And then we've got, I mean, we, what we're doing in the UK, we're building farms in the middle of the North Sea and forgetting to build the roads to the farms, right? Fabulous. I mean, who thought of that? And it's just ludicrous. So I'm less interested in the structures of the distribution. What I would say is the, the distribution networks are very varied in the UK. We've got lots of different organizations and some of them are really, really good and really exciting. And others are just still hose pipes, not thinking about the future. And there does need to be a lot more tension there. On your whole, oh, I love that you like these, those metrics. Right, so what's very weird about, and I'm sure it's, it is the same in every government, you can tell me whether it is or not. Actually, the, this whole system design has been used for the last eight years in, in the UK for policy planning, not with the demand bit, but just on the supply bit, right? It's been used for policy planning, but, but it never really gets into policy. It's, it's really, really interesting. And it doesn't go beyond the modelers in the department, right? And the treasury don't even, I mean, so I've been doing quite a lot of workshops with them on whole system costs and for them to start to understand to use them as metrics. And really it's been the last two, 18 months, I would say, they're starting to understand it and they're starting to, to appreciate it. God, the levelized cost of electricity is so simple. That's why we love it, a silver bullet. It's easy, no variables, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, and this woman comes along and she wants everything to be a bit more complicated. Um, get her off. Um, but we are getting quite a lot of traction um, in parts of the treasury. We are I'm doing, as I say, quite a lot of work with the IEA. And the World Economic Forum, um, we're doing a big piece of work for this COP coming up, which will be really trying to bottom this out. And the other thing that's interesting about it is once you've got those metrics, I've been talking to some of the pension funds and saying, are you interested in doing mini CFDs for heat pumps, for example? Mm -hmm. Right. They said, yeah, sure. Well, we did smart meters. We can do as long as we've got some form of contractual um, underpinning, we can really lean into distributed assets. So these metrics help value those assets within a whole system thing. Anyway, I dream, I dream a lot, okay. <laughs> um, so I hope, but um, they'll start to realize that certainly network costs and balancing costs are, are too big just to put as an extra in their calculations. Thank you so much. I'm just conscious of the time. Yeah, um, I'm sure people have things to do, um, but it's a real testament to the quality of our speaker and the interest that people have shown that there's so many people still here at 2.30 uh, and I know still online. I just want to thank um, Sincerely, uh, Laura, as particularly as, as Fergal said, for just stepping down the steps and onto the stage without sort of missing a beat. So, um, but it just shows the, the professional from the political ar arena, advocacy, all the things that you've done, um, which I would normally go through and introduce a speaker at great length, but we just decided not to do that and have you straight on. But I think you've demonstrated without any introduction how, um, how, good at communicating you are these issues as I said I mean I'm we're crying out I think the world is crying out for people who can actually communicate these complex questions to the broad audience and I will say that you know in fairness to the ESB it that has been part of the ESB's business is not simply just to function as uh, an energy you know in the energy sector by the way if there's such a thing as an energy sector in a discrete sense anymore. And I think you've kind of made yes. that point that you can't read all of the old lines and demarcations are all kind of breaking down. But I think that, that's the business, you know, ESB has obviously got its own business to attend to, but wants to ensure that it's not just part of the debate, but fostering and facilitating these um, opportunities to um, disseminate information and help people analyze how things are changing so fast. It's also the business that we're in, um, in the Institute, the IIEA, um, so it's been my great pleasure to chair this session. 
we've three, four more to go in this um, uh, in this series. Um, I want to thank you all for your attendance here today, both uh, in person and uh, those of you who have joined online. Um, thanks to Bevan Cody um, in particular and her team in the ESP. Uh, thanks to my own team in the IIEA. And we look forward to seeing you all again. But most importantly, a big round of applause for our terrific speaker, Laura Sam. Thank you.